Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala So my dear brothers and sisters, um, we've just talked about all this amrad al-qulub, the diseases, the weaknesses that we have. And it is said, if we do recognize some of these, it is said, just remember that, that there is no greater honor that Allah bestows on an abd, on a servant, than the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes him aware of the lowliness of his nafs. And there is no greater lowliness that Allah afflicts his abd with than to veil him from consciousness of the lowliness of his nafs. So it's a grace, if you find faults within yourself, this is a grace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, just remember that. And all of this is not meant, yesterday I was told that some people felt depressed. This is not to make you depressed. Yes, you should be conscious, I should be conscious of, but this is to thrust us forward. I need to do something. It should be motivational rather than withdraw kids. Nothing is too late. This is why Allah SWT is wanting us to hear all of this so that we make the necessary changes. Now we come to the next among the, the fruits of this tazkiyah which is as we said once that tawheed comes within ourselves once all of these diseases are addressed gradually external actions start to change how we act how we talk what we feel our akhlaq akhlaq is what is our reality there is khuluq which is our exterior and there is akhlaq there is the, there is the khalq which is our exterior and there is akhlaq which is our interior image there is a beautiful dua of the Prophet وسلم, which we can learn and remind ourselves every day. Whenever he looked in the mirror, what did he say? Does anybody know this dua? Allahumma anta hassanta khalqi fahassin khuluqi. Oh Allah, you have made my exterior beautiful. So beautify my interior, my khuluq. But if we just look, do I look good? Then that's not sufficient. Remind ourselves that I need to be internally beautiful. How do we become internally beautiful? Is through this whole process. So what is akhlaq? It is what comes naturally to us. And many of these things may not come naturally. Sometimes it requires an effort. That you keep doing it, keep doing it. Rasulullah gives us an example that a person lies. And he keeps lying and he keeps lying and he keeps lying till he is called a kadhab. That's his label. And a person may have weaknesses but he starts to tell the truth. And he tells the truth. And he keeps telling the truth, keeps telling the truth till nothing else comes out from him except the truth. Then he is known as a siddiq a truthful person so on some of these things we have to strive and we keep working on it till that becomes a natural state that that's what is going to come out from me when I'm faced with a challenge so we have certain akhlaq with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of which is ikhlas this is our conduct with Allah Ikhlas, that we should be pure exactly what Allah wants. Allah is pure and He accepts nothing except that which is pure. So, what we say, we should always ask, and this is the ultimate, this is the juice of the fruit. You know, you put the seed, and the plant grows, and the tree grows, and the flowers come, and the fruit comes, and the fruit ripens, and finally the juice comes out. That's what the whole process was about. That's why you put the seed in the ground. That's the last thing to come. But we need to keep working on that. Is there any other intention in my action other than Allah? Am I trying to please anyone else other than Allah? And try and purify that. Think about the action before we plan it, while we are doing it. Analyze it after. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, make me mukhlis. Make me 
purely for you. Second is shukr. Akhlaq with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be, we should be among the shakir. That everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows us with, we must acknowledge and we must show shukr. The least of which is to recognize that it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then to say with the tongue, to feel reality in the heart and feel grateful. And best of all, is to use that ni'mah, that blessing Allah has given us, whether it's the sight, whether it's our children, whether it's wealth, whether it's health, to use it in a way that would please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's showing shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a practical way. Next is sabr with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does things He is different than anyone else or anything else so we cannot understand things. Allah is the wisest therefore we accept what comes to us. And the least level of sabr is not to complain with the tongue. Higher than that is not even to feel in the heart that this condition should change. And higher than that is to actually have a rida, to feel pleased. Oh, this is what has happened. This is what Allah chose for me. What does it mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an example of a man who he gave everything to. Name and fame and wealth and family and power. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gradually took everything away. The wealth was gone. Every property was gone. Finally the roof fell in and his whole family was wiped out except for his wife. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicted him with one disease after another, after another, till such time that parts of his body were disintegrating. They would come off. He was completely bedridden. He was thrown out of his village or township because people said oh we are going to catch this disease all the wealth was gone his wife used to go and work as as a cleaning woman for people this princess of one time you know who I'm talking about Ayyub ultimately a time came when she was she was shaitan would go and incite people against them they all even stopped giving her employment and one day she's coming back and on the street she sees a nice dignified old man, kind looking man sitting there. He said, oh my little girl, you look distressed. She said, yes, I have some issues. Let me show you a solution. And he suggests for her something that implied shirk. So she comes home to her husband who is bedridden, who cannot move by himself. He cannot move and said, I met a nice old man on the street who suggested this as a solution to our problems. And Ayyub couldn't move except for his tongue. He said, if I could, I would give you a hundred lashes for saying something like this. Because it implied shirk. And then what did he say? After all of this affliction, now he felt that even the Iman in his family, the Tawheed in his family was being attacked. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it part of the Qur'an. It's very beautiful. وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ And when Ayyub called on his Lord. And how did he call on his Lord? أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الضُّرُّ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ He didn't say, Ya Allah, you have sent all these difficulties for me. He didn't say, why me? I am your prophet. He said, oh Allah, I have been masani. He downplayed, I have been touched by some affliction, some dur. And then what does, look at his adab with Allah. He knows it's coming from Allah. He doesn't say, you sent this. He says, I have been touched, third person. I have been touched by some difficulties and hardships and harm. And then he, what does he say? He doesn't say remove it. He says, وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ And you are the most merciful of those who show mercy. That's all he said. 
Because when you say that, what will happen automatically? Allah is the most merciful. How beautiful. This is teaching us what sabr is. How we address. Because sometimes when these things happen, much less than what happened to him, we say, why me? I'm a righteous person. Are you as righteous as Ayyub? Alayhi salam. There is a companion, as we know, after Fajr, Rasulullah sallallahu used to sit with his companions and teach them and talk about their dreams. And so some of the companions noted that one of his companions, as soon as the salah was finished, would leave. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, this person, he never joins us, he leaves. So next morning when he was leaving, Rasulullah sallallahu called him, he said, why is it that you don't sit in our companionship? So he said, Ya Rasulullah, I have a reason. Rasulullah said, I'm in a hurry. He said, tell me what is the problem. He said, Ya Rasulullah, between my wife and me, we have one sheet of cloth. So when you are leading the salah, I put on that sheet of cloth, of cloth to cover my aura, so I can join you in salah. And my wife doesn't have enough cloth at home to cover her aura to perform her fajr. So if I sit with you, by the time I get back home, her fajr would be qada. So I leave. So on this day, because of all of this happened, he got home a little late. So his wife said, why are you so late? So he narrated what had happened. And she became very upset. She said, you dared to complain to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destined for us. You complained to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Allah, even the fact he wasn't complaining, just the fact that he mentioned it. This is sabr. This is sabr. One more. Imam, one of the, the great Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal radiallahu an, was in a lot of pain in his last moments. And when you are in severe pain, those who have felt it, sometimes what happens? You moan. Mm. Little sounds come. Mm. So one of his great companions of his time, and that, those are the companions, they came, he came for... for to, to visit him during his sickness and he was sitting with him and he heard a few groans, a few moans from the pain of the great Imam and he didn't let it go. He talked to him, he said, Ya Imam, our Salaf people before us used to consider any sound that came from pain as a complaint, as a shakwa. From that moment till he died, nobody heard a moan or a groan from Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. This is called sabr. This is called shukr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how, these are examples for us. This is akhlaq with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawakkul. To depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that everything have absolute dependence on Allah. When we make our effort, after the effort, during the effort, tawakkul with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring about what is best. And having rida or pleasure with that, that if he's decided something other than what I wanted, that's the right thing, that's the best thing. And of course to have... Always our hopes and our fears should be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have described that a life of a believer is like a bird with two wings. Hope of Allah's forgiveness and fear of his disobedience. And the closer we get to the end of our lives, what should be more? Hope. One person was dying and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa went to visit him. He said, how do you feel? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I have fear of my actions, of what I have done. And I have hope of Allah's forgiveness. He says, whoever dies in this state will enter. Will have, Allah will protect him from what? 
he is afraid of and give him what he hopes for which is Allah's forgiveness <clears throat> and of course one of the other with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of akhlaq is to always remember him now we come again like I said this is just brief because of limitation of time akhlaq with people how we behave with each other so if we have tawheed and we know that a Muslim because now I'm a Muslim I have tawheed in me cannot lie then I become a truthful person nothing so when I say something people know that that's the truth and that's what should come out so truthfulness in our words truthfulness in our actions and truthfulness in our ahwal if I'm showing somebody my condition if I'm looking for somebody's sympathy and I show them that I need sympathy that's not truthfulness okay? if I'm looking for some help in monetary and I make myself look poorer than I am that's not truthfulness if I am showing people that I am more righteous and pious than I am to impress people that's not truthfulness so this is something we must work on no matter what and when are you challenged when do people lie when there is something to gain or protect themselves from something some harm no matter what's going to happen say the truth <coughs> then leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change the situation sometimes it may be a test for you maybe it will lead you into difficulty but you are going to difficulty in a state of truthfulness trustworthiness and as was reminded yesterday these are character traits these are titles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sadiq al-ameen when you are trusted with anything with information with a word with something somebody came to you with not, with some for advice that should remain with you <coughs> if you are trusted with a possession somebody gave you wealth I keep this and when the time comes about I don't remember you gave me anything you know, trust whatever you are entrusted with among the trust is what your wealth because this is an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala among the trust is your health it's a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you are smoking you're violating that trust if you're doing anything that harms you you're violating that trust the children that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you are a trust Allah takes them back when he wants therefore fulfill the rights of the children teach them the right thing this is a trust you preserve and protect the trust become trustworthy so that anybody guess who used to bring their things for safekeeping with Rasulullah his arch enemies the kuffar who didn't believe in his message but they wanted something kept safely they would bring it you know one of the reasons why Ali radiallahu anhu was left in Mecca when the hijrah took place besides lying on the bed at that time <coughs> because Rasulullah had the trust of some of the kuffar and he said Ali return these to the owners and then make your way to Medina against his enemies trust <clears throat> we have to learn to be forgiving don't take things personally somebody wronged you move on forget about it don't just keep it and keep it and keep it forgive Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forgive I gave you some examples there are hundreds of examples forgive forgive let it go for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of Allah if you forgive for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you if you fulfill the needs of a person find people who are needy who don't ask you fulfill the person's need of the dunya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill your needs of the dunya and the akhirah you cover the faults of people they make mistakes you don't have to point it out do you know what so and so is doing do you know what they do they do this thing. if you cover put satar cover their faults why because then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cover your faults in the dunya and on the day of judgment 
You fulfill the needs of a person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of your needs in the dunya and especially on the day when you are most needy, the day of judgment. Gentleness, rifq, gentleness, gentleness. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whenever gentleness, softness enters anything, it makes it beautiful. Be gentle with people. Gentle, kind, considerate. Gentle with the words. In one narration, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, as you know in the hadith, what is Islam? And he said, Islam is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know the hadith of Jibreel. In another place he was asked, what is Islam? He said, that you feed. That you feed people and you talk gently to people. You talk beautifully to people. You talk softly to people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent two of his chosen to the worst of humanity. He sent Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam to Fir'aun and gave him instructions. Gave them instructions what? Talk to him, qawlan layyan, gentle words. And Allah knows he's not going to listen. It's for us. Even, so, none of us are as bad as Fir'aun. So should we talk to them as like that? But even Fir'aun was sent his messengers. None of us are like Musa alayhi And no one will visit is as bad as Fir'aun. So we should be gentle. Gentle in our words. We should always avoid suspicion and we should always think good of people. Find excuses for people. If he's doing this, maybe there's a reason. Maybe there's, he's not praying. Maybe he prayed at home. Think good of people. This is akhlaq. The Prophet ﷺ tells us, especially for believers, but this is for others also. That the wealth, the, bl the blood, the wealth, and the honor of a Muslim is sacred, is haram for another Muslim. Nothing we, should, we do should harm the person physically, should harm his wealth or his property and his honor, which is what we do with our tongues. Akhlaq, generosity. Generosity. Be generous. The least of which is to smile. Sadaqah. Be a smiling person. He says, oh, he's become very muttaqi. He's now like this. He never smiles. That's not Islam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Bassam, smiling. We're not saying you go into fits of laughter all the time because excessive laughter also hardens the heart. But be smiling, be pleasant to people that people feel good. Spread the salam. Afshu salam. What does that mean? When I say assalamu alaikum means your blood, your property, your honor is safe with me. That's salam. So, be generous. Give. Be giving. Most of us are takers, but Rasulullah teaches us that the upper hand is better than the lower hand. Give. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, people, you know, you would say, well, he was poor. No, he was not poor. He was the wealthiest. Why? Because a lot of wealth came. And he gave it away. Does that make you poor? That shows you how rich you are. You don't need anything. You're just giving it all away. Giving it all away. One time Imam Al-Junaid with his Ashab went to for, for uh, Hajj and they were sitting around the Baytullah and a very generous good Muslim of Mecca heard that Al Junaid is here with his Ashab so he came, he was a very wealthy man he looked at them, they looked like beggars because the clothes were so simple and all so he came with a bag full of gold coins he put it, Ya Sheikh, this is a hadiah for you for your companions so Al Junaid let him put the money there. Then he asked him, Do you have more? He said, Yes, I have more. 
He said, would you like to have more? He said, yes, I would like to have more. So Junaid picked it up and gave it to him. He said, you need this more than we need it. Generosity. <laughs> but telling you that if we have that zuhud, that we are content with what? Contentment with Allah. What is, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa describes richness? Who is rich? The one who is content with what he has. A person may have, a, it's not dependent on what you have. It is what is the state of your heart. You may have billions and if you're not content, then you don't have that. So, qana and zuhud, to feel that I don't need anything more. This is the ultimate richness. I don't need to go. One time, many years ago, a person, a people came to America and we took them into this gr these big grocery stores. And he insisted on going through every aisle. And there are aisles after aisles that loaded up. So I said, you know, wondered why he did that. So we asked him, you know, are you looking for something? He says, no. So why are you doing this? Wasting time. He says, I want you to see how many things there are that I don't need. <laughs> That's a lesson for us. Haya, we talked briefly about that, having haya with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ultimate haya with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allah is always watching me. Allah always sees me. He hears every word I say. Allah sees inside me the thoughts that are coming. The thoughts that I'm entertaining, the inclinations I have. So anything that's displeasing to, to him, I have haya. I move away. Allah is with me. He's watching me. He knows. Ya'lamu sirra wa akhwa. He, akhfa. he even knows what is hidden inside and akhfa thoughts that haven't even yet formulated. He already knows that. I don't want him to see me with anything that he doesn't like. Haya with Allah. I feel ashamed. And similarly, haya with people. Okay? Rasulullah, one of the companions, the most, who was known for his haya is who? Uthman radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa once was reclining with who? With Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhumah. And as he was reclining, part of his shirt lifted up so the lower part of his thigh was exposed. And he didn't do anything about it. And then there's a knock on the door and Uthman radiallahu an enters. And as he sees Uthman radiallahu anhu, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa pulls his shirt down to cover his thigh. He said, Ya Rasulullah, we were with you. Why did you do this? He said, should I not have haya with someone with whom the angels even have haya? Haya with people. Especially, how can I be seen disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This should be, again, something that comes from within. Humility with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawadu. Okay. How should we be, we be with people? We'll summarize it in three sentences. If you cannot benefit someone, then do not at least harm him. If you cannot bring happiness to a person, don't bring him grief. If you cannot find something to praise about someone, then don't say something. Speak ill of him. If we keep that in mind, inshallah, we will take care of a lot of these things. Now as our Sheikh keeps reminding you that this is practice, it's not theory, it's not a feel-good session, it's not a depression, depression session. So I'm going to, I have tried to formulate some practical steps that you can implement according to your capacity, all together or sequentially, some of the things 
That it's nothing other than what we have discussed yesterday and today. De set aside time for a daily diet of useful ilm. Pondering on the Quran, learning one or two ayats. What do they mean? The ayats of greatness of Allah SWT, about the Akhirah. Reading some of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. They talk about the tongue. They talk about the heart. Those sort of, I'm not talking about fiqhi issues. Okay? That's also important. But in this pursuit, things that would help you. Reading about tazkiyah. Reading some of the notes that you have taken to remind you. Daily set aside. There should be something every day. Just like you feed your body. You feed your ruh with something useful every day. Number two, every day, maybe before you go to sleep, renew your tawbah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, this is what my life has been, this is what I have done, this is what I have done today. I beg your forgiveness, I promise to stop, I have stopped, I promise not to return back to this. I am making my effort to make up all of what I need to do, daily with sincerity, tawbah. Number three, Set aside time for khalwa, for solitude, to think and reflect like we talked yesterday. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever you can take, preferably when there is no disturbance. When people are not going to bother you, when the bell is not going to ring, when the phone is not going to ring, when things... Where you sit in pure solitude and you reflect. And you're not sitting there, the solitude itself is not the goal. It's a means to the goal that you use that time to do certain things. Like setting conditions for yourself. Reflecting, who am I? That's the ultimate. Who am I? What is the state of my nufus? What is the state of my qalb? What are the diseases I have? What effort do I need to make to change? And making conditions and at the end for tomorrow and making a hisab and accountability of how did I comply with those things. Sit in khalwa, in solitude for that. Dhikr, we talked about. Set aside time for reading the Quran. 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Start with what you are able to do regularly. And you can increase on that as Allah inspires you. Preferably after Fajr. Sit down with the book of Allah SWT and read. It's not how much you read, but it's with how much focus you read. Read it for what it is, and then spend some time trying to understand the meaning. What, does, what is the message of my Lord for me? What do I need to do? Extra salawat, doing some extra salah, doing the adhkar that you can find online and in books that Rasulullah recommended for the morning and for the evening. There's a whole list of them. Start with a few, two or three. And when you start doing them regularly and you feel hunger for more, you do more. What you say, you must know the meaning and you must internalize. It's not just, it's, dhikr is not just, actually it is on the tongue, but better than that is, it should be in the heart or both. Okay? Spending some time in istighfar. Preferably just before the sun rises. What is istighfar? Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Thinking about the things that we have done. And asking for forgiveness. Hundred times in the morning, hundred times in the, in, in the evening. The ultimate best time is the time of sahar. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those. Mustaghfirina bil ashar. Those who ask for forgiveness at the time of sahar. Before, before dawn. Sit. You can sit with beads. Count a hundred times. Why? Because the one who was sinless used to do that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes he would sit in gatherings and people would count that he is saying Astaghfirullah. And there are many forms of Astaghfirullah. Longer form, the Sayyidul Astaghfar. Or a short form. Start with the short form. Astaghfirullah. Two words combined in one. Oh Allah, I beg for your forgiveness. And think, feel it. Astaghfirullah. Feel the cleansing. Bring those spots on your heart. Imagine those spots. I lied. Astaghfirullah. I did this. Astaghfirullah. Don't be in a rush to count the beads. Feel it. The beads are to help you to count and to know so that you're not just focusing on counting. You can use your fingers. You can use what you want. Tahleel. La ilaha illallah. Hundred times in the morning and evening. La ilaha illallah. Think of what that means. This is the ultimate 
ultimate of all statements la ilaha illallah feel it in your heart look within your heart feel the cleansing that it brings empty that feel physically you are emptying your heart la la cleanse cleanse ilaha illallah it's just like a garden when you're going to when a, a gardener is to make a garden what does he have to do remove the weeds remove the thorns remove the rocks la ilaha take out everything that's in there then you put the seed of illallah reflect hundred times subhanallah wa bihamdihi O oh Allah, you are above all imperfections in everything. Wa bihamdihi and praise and thanks be to you. Hundred times. Two that are light on the tongue, heavy on the scale. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanallah. <coughs> and say, sending salah and salam. Durood Sharif. Allahumma salli ala sayyid. Long forms, short forms, multiple forms. Start with the short form that you can do regularly. If nothing else, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali. Hundred times in the morning, hundred. Make this a daily wird. Number five, work on the quality of each salah, on focus. Do two rakah nafil. Then judge yourself, how was it? Let me do two more and see if I can focus a little bit better, gradually. So, working on that, very, very important. Number six, Hifzul Lisan, Ghaddul Basar. Protect your tongue. We talked about the tongue, the tongue, the one, the master control of everything. Guard the tongue every day and guard your eyes. Take to some form of extra fasting, Nawafil fast. This is again part of that thing, eating less, training ourselves, so that the nafs doesn't become uncontrolled and strong. The example of that is like a horse that is untrained, and that hasn't been broken, and the rider gets on and he starts bucking. Now if you keep feeding that horse and making it stronger, what will it do? It will throw you off quicker. That's the state of our nafs. The nafs has to be controlled. It has to, if it's, it's rebelling, Treat it with hunger. Make it weak so you can control it. Fasting. You can start with three days in a month. The three white nights as they are called, you know. 13, 14, 15. You can start with one day a month. You can go to Monday and Thursday fasting. Some form of fasting. Dua and munajat. As we said, talking conversations with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua at all those special opportune moments where dua is specially accepted. Be sincere in the dua. Follow the adab of the dua. Beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Persist and insist and keep just like a beggar. They don't go away. They keep knocking on the window of your car till they get something. Be a beggar in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to not leave your door. Ya Allah. Dua. Start getting up for tahajjud. If you don't at all, one night in a week. Where you don't have to rush off to work next morning. Increase it, see, because this is essential part of this. Getting into the habit of tahajjud. About one companion, Rasulullah said, he has got all the good qualities only if he would be regular with his tahajjud and he found out that he was not and from that day till he died he never skipped one tahajjud so there is special spiritual blessings because as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us he descends in his own majestic way in the last third of the night and there are special moments where he asks is there someone who is looking for my forgiveness is there someone who needs something that I can give him special moments so get up a little bit before Fajr so you have, and not just so you have to rush that I did so many. Start with two rakah or four rakah, but slowly, slowly with reflection, with focus when there is no other dis distraction. 
And as we mentioned when we started today, guard the environment that you expose yourself to. The companions that you expose yourself. Limit your exposure to people and environments that are harmful. And as we mentioned yesterday, I'll put an 11th one on this. Try always to be in a state of external tahara so that it may have a wudu as much as you can so that it may help to, uh, to achieve internal tahara. Wudu, yeah, to be tahur. So as we said, I hope that this session has been one of hope. This is to give us hope, it's not to make us depressed, because we have a job to do. Just remember, were it not to pardon his creatures, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have afflicted the best of his creation with sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the ability to commit sins. Kullu bani adam qatta. All the children of Bani Adam will sin, they are sinners. The best of those who turn in tawbah. So it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if, if we didn't sin, as Rasulullah said, He would have removed us and brought someone else who sinned. Which this is not a license for you to sin, by the way. This is to tell you the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have hope in Him. What happens when tawbah is you renew your tawbah. We are weak. You may make a promise, you break it. That shouldn't okay, I'm a... Make the intention again. Renew the tawbah again. You do your best. Even if you keep falling into the same weakness. If you are sincere, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you. Analyze why you keep falling into that sin. Most often it's going to be this. The environment and the companionship that leads to that. So... Someone has said that there are three types of people. There's a person whose concern for the Akhara keeps him too busy from his dunya. And he is among the Faizin or Faizun, the successful. There is a person whose concern for the dunya keeps him too busy from his akhirah. And he is from the halakin, the ones who are destroyed. And there is a person who is busy both with dunya and with akhirah. And they say he is among the mukhatirun, the ones who are in danger. They are the risk takers. Concerned with both, because they are on a slippery slope, they could fall one way or the other. So the major concern should be for the Akhara. And when you have some time left from that, you are free to pursue the dunya. That's the real balance. And you said, you, should, you know, when you talk about it, you should have some balance in your life. Well, what is the balance? One way of balance is, Work for this dunya as long as you plan to live here and work for the Akhara as long as you plan to live there. <laughs> that's balance. I mean, that's justice. Alright? I'm going to conclude with a few quotes from our Salaf. Someone said, Let your home be khalwa. Let your meal be hunger. Let your words be munajat, communication with Allah. Either you die trying to fight your ailment or you reach a cure. Someone has said, it's very beautiful. Oh Allah, how can I ever be happy when I have disobeyed you? Oh Allah, how can I ever not be happy when I have known you? Oh Allah, how can I ask you when I am a sinner? Oh Allah, how can I not ask you when you are the most generous? Let's reflect on those.
And one of the people of this path, Ibn Atta'ullah Sikandari, said words to the meaning of which is this. He said, Oh Allah, what has he lost who has found you? And what has he gained who has lost you? Allahumma ati nafsi taqwaha wa zakkiha anta khairu man zakkaha anta waliuha wa maulaha. O Allah, give taqwa to our nufus and purify our nafs. You are the guardian, the owner, and the best of those who purify. Allahumma khsim li min khashyatika ma tahulu bihi bayni wa bayna ma siyatik wa min tu'atika ma tuballighuni bihi jannatak. وَمِنَ الْيَقِينِ مَا تُحَوَّنُ بِهِ عَلَيَّ مَسَائِبَ الدُّنْيَا O Allah, a portion for me from your reverent fear that keeps me away from sinfulness and your disobedience. And a portion for me from your obedience that I obey you to the extent that it helps me reach Jannah. And O oh Allah, a portion from me, yaqeen and certainty, so that I can go through the trials and tribulations of this dunya. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-arba, min almin la yanfa, wa min qalbin la yakhsha, wa min nafsin la tashba, wa min du'a'in la yusma. O Allah, I seek refuge in you from ilm, from knowledge that is not useful, from a heart that is not in reverent fear of you, from a nafs that is not satiated, and from a dua that is not heard or answered. Allahumma inya saluka hubbak wa hubba man yangfa'uni hubbuhu indak. Allahumma ma ataytani mimma uhib faj'alahu li quwwatin fi ma tuhib. اللهم ما زويت عني مما أحب فجعله لي فراغا فيما تحب اللهم يا أو الله I ask you for your love and the love of those that will benefit me with you O Allah what you give of me give to me of that which I love make it a strength for me to do that which you love. And Allah, what you keep away from me of that which I love, make it free time for me to do that which you love. Allahumma tahir qalbi mimma siwak wa aqimni bi sidq al ubudiya bayna yadayk. O Allah, grant in our hearts, in my heart, the reality of Tawheed and let us be among those who stand in front of you having fulfilled the rights of Ubudiya with sincerity. Ameen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashadu an la ilaha illa nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.